This is a production of Cornell University. Hope everyone is uh, doing great today. It's really an honor for me to be here today to present some past uh, research and also um, some more current work with uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion initiatives that I've been undertaking. So, and also want to preface that I've not given an in-person talk since 2019. So <laughs> if, I'm <rusty. laughs> if I'm rusty, please uh, forgive me. <laughs> so as Dr. Buckler uh, introduced already, my name is Dr. Morin um, I am very active on Twitter. So if you have Twitter, feel free to follow me at uh, the Morgan Trail. It is a ton on the Oregon Trail. So it's kind of cheesy, but <laughs> hopefully you can remember, remember it. So I have a bit of an unusual pathway into science. So my undergraduate work was actually in English liter literature with an emphasis on uh, science fiction. <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> with an emphasis on science fiction. So I uh, spent a semester abroad at Lancaster University in England um, there I was doing like mainly like Shakespeare and Lake poets out there. And then I came back and then um, I was very interested in adaptation of sci-fi from literature into film. And so my capstone was on the uh, book with the Stream of Electric Sheep by Philip K. Dick and the movie uh, Blade Runner with uh, Harrison Ford. And the title was When Loosely Based on Becomes New. Define the limits of adaptation and the film Blade Runner and Polk Dick's novel, The Dream of Electric Sheep. And I was interested in exploring, like how far can you take an adaptation before it becomes like its own original uh, piece of work? So that was kind of an interesting uh, project to focus on. So some of the experiences I've had over the past decade. So as uh, Dr. Buckler mentioned, I was out in South Korea exploring uh, plant resistance gene function and uh, trying to produce more resistant uh, crop plants. In New York City, uh, right before the pandemic, I was with a startup company, Annika Biosciences, where we were using living organisms to design sustainable ways to track and trace uh, products through supply chains, which is um, you know, a big issue even now with the uh, supply chain issues currently we're experiencing. And uh, more recently, uh, teaching online courses for non-scientists and uh, working with the consulting agency on uh, issues of uh, ecological importance. So the question that kind of brought me from sci-fi, science fiction into science reality was, you know, plants have immune systems. You know, it's something that I wasn't really thinking about when I was a student. A lot of the focus was on human immune systems and human health. But I think that uh, for a lot of students, myself, uh, from, uh, from my personal experience, um, kind of plant immune systems were kind of not in the forefront of the mind, I would say. So uh, I was uh, participating in the federal work study program to help pay tuition. And another thing that, thing that surprised me was that I didn't even know you could work in a science lab as part of that. I thought that, you know, work study, it's like, okay, I'll um, you know, work in the cafeteria or the library or something. I didn't even know that like a lab stint was like covered by that program. So the lab that I was really interested in was uh, Dr. Walter Gaskin's lab. So he was doing, he's, he's uh, doing really interesting research with plant immune systems and plant um, health and everything. So that was like very fascinating for me. So this is a picture I took at the Missouri Botanical Garden. This is the Japanese uh, garden out there. And if you see here, most of the plants are very green and they're happy and healthy. And that's because most plants are resistant to most pathogens. So, which is contrasted with this uh, picture of a bean field. So if you look on the left-hand side, you see a row of nice and healthy green bean crops. And then right next to that is a very sick, um, diseased row there. And this illustrates that with our uh, modern uh, kind of uh, cropping systems, we have a lot of the same genetic background that are planted out there. 
Um, if you have a pathogen that can break through the resistance, then you can, it can be really devastating to you know, the field. So the plants on the left have a gene that makes them resistant against this pathogen, and then the plants on the right are susceptible to that pathogen. So I did a lot of my undergrad work, um, sorry, not undergrad, sorry, graduate level work, <laughs> sorry, with a model system, Arabidopsis uh, taliana. So it's kind of like the lab mouse of the plant world. Um, you know, a very early plant to be uh, sequenced, grows very fast. Um, uh, surprisingly, you know, resilient, uh, hard to kill unless you forget to water it or, <laughs> or something. Um, and uh, very easy to infect with this model that, that bacterial pathogen, uh, Pseudomonas syringi, uh, DC3000, which uh, pathovirus tomato. So if you look on the right, that's a tomato fruit with, it's uh, uh, been infected. So you can see the leaf, you have like these uh, uh, chlorotic yellowing uh, areas, and then you have the water soaked lesions there. And then you also have those similar um, water soaking on the fruit of the tomato. So if you go to the store, for example, and you're, um, you know, trying to buy a tomato, although this this is a plant pathogen, so it, you won't get sick from it. Like, you know, it's not visually appealing to eat, so you might pass over that, you know, that fruit for a healthy one. So this pathogen enters leaves through the uh, stomata, um, also through other openings. For example, if like a caterpillar is chewing on the leaf or uh, through the hydathodes, like um, on the outside of the leaf also. And this is a cross section showing the um, apoplastic spaces where this colonizes. Um, and the very far right is a nice image, um, you know, actually showing bacteria in this apoplastic area. And the apoplast is a pretty nutrient poor um, environment. Uh, so this is a, so the bacteria uh, or, uh, have ways to access nutrients from the from the cells uh, that are surrounding them. So I like to think of the uh, plant immune system as kind of like a castle. So if you look at a, this image of a castle, uh, they're built for um, you know, fortified uh, with defense uh, defenses. So you have like you know thick walls. You have maybe like a moat on the outside. Uh, you have um, Maybe like archers that are can like shoot down arrows from higher up, and uh, plant immune system is also very uh, multi-layered uh, defenses. So I was talking about bacteria, just as an example, but um, you know, there are also other pathogens. You know, fungi and oomycetes, um, nematodes, um, viruses. Some plants are also pathogens of other plants. So there's like a bunch of other um, uh, examples, but kind of using bacteria is kind of a, oops, just for, just for this example. And uh, so the bacteria here, uh, the bacteria that I was working with has this needle-like structure, the type three secretion system that it can secrete these effector proteins into this cell, which can uh, evolutionarily, um, you know, evolve to benefit the, pathogen in some way. And then on the other end of it, plants have these resistance proteins, um, MBS LRR proteins that can detect effectors and then uh, spark an immune response called uh, ETI, which is effector triggered immunity. And uh, if you see here, there are these receptors that are on the outside that can detect these, uh, they're called PAMPs here, pathogen associated molecular patterns, but I believe that in the literature, people are moving more towards MAMPs, so microbes associated molecular patterns, which encompasses uh, beneficial pathogens or beneficial microbes as well as harmful pathogens. And so this just uh, shows kind of recognition of these effectors by the R proteins. So in some cases it's a direct recognition. So you have like the effector that's directly interacting with the resistance protein. But often you also have this uh, indirect recognition. So you have another host protein that's 
uh, existing in a complex with the resistance protein. And then when the pathogen targets that host protein, then it can um, like set off the alarm for the resistance protein. And this often results in uh, hypersensitive cell death. So you get the, this is in a Arabidopsis leaf. So on the left is the um, uh, normal looking leaf. And then when you have this recognition, you can oftentimes get this, um, you know, crinkled uh, uh, program cell death response. And so the, these are some examples of some of the general structures of the resistance proteins. So kind of the conserved features are this uh, NBS LRR um, motif in the middle. And then at the end terminus, you can have a variable domain, so maybe a full interleukin receptor domain or a coiled coil domain. And then at the C terminus, you can have other um, additions as well. So one example is the uh, WRKY. Uh, so workies are plant-specific transcription factors, but plants have evolved to use this as kind of like a decoy to detect the pathogen. So that's a very uh, clever uh, trick. So why even study these effectors in the first place? So. As I mentioned earlier, um, you know, plants are constantly evolving, pathogens are evolving. Um, there's this term, the uh, arms race that's going on between the plants and the pathogens. And you know, studying the vectors that are out there currently um, gives us a window into the state of their evolutionary conflict and may help us to predict where the conflict is going potentially. And you know, ideally the goal is to be able to uh, you know, create resistant plants. And also effectors can help us identify the, the salient features of the immune system. So I kind of like to think of them as, you know, a lot of the, they're the results of the millions of years of uh, coevolution. So, um, you know, each effector is, um, uh, you know, already been selected to be doing something. So using them as kind of guides to what are the important parts of the host plant. And uh, currently we have you know, a lot of uh, rapid uh, sequencing techniques that we can use. So, um, you know, I, rapidly sequencing uh, emerging pathogens and getting those sequences out quickly. And uh, interestingly, uh, prediction of effector function based on the sequence alone isn't always that reliable. Uh, a lot of these effectors are molecular mimics, so they have structures that resemble structure, uh, structures of host proteins, but the sequences are hard to pick from the sequences. So using these as kind of like probes to connect amino acid sequence with structure. Um, I feel like I wrote, I wrote this part before, um, you know, I have a lot of really fun uh, uh, structure prediction computational tools that are out there now, like DeepMind and all these things. So, um, you know, I think it could still be interesting, but um, you will see where, how things go with the, the uh, computational prediction. So the uh, effector that I was studying as a student was AVRPS4, which is a pretty unusual effector, as I'll show, uh, get to later. So I was working with um, Walter over here, my PI, and then, uh, Saika was a postdoc and Sanghi postdoc. And we found that AVRPS4 interacts with this uh, immune regulator called EDS1. So EDS1 is a protein, it's a positive regulator of immunity. So if you knock it out, then oftentimes you get hyper susceptible plants. And I want to mention that having mentors as allies is really important. So Walter is a, was a very fantastic ally for me as a black student in the lab who um, I'll, I'll tell a story here that I told to uh, uh, both Dr. Buckler's uh, last night. So I know that some of you have already probably uh, submitted GRFP um, proposals for NSF. So um, I submitted, you know, NSF proposal to look at AVRPS4 and we got the reviews back. So Two of them were outstanding, you know, very excellent broader impacts. 
you know, cool idea. Um, you know, this is fantastic. And then the third one was like totally opposite of that, which happens a lot of the time. Um, it was, I got, they sent me like a bulleted, like a numbered list of all the things that were wrong with it. Um, like kind of like not mentioning the strengths of it. There were like all the weaknesses. So like um, number one, you know, having a humanities background means that I won't succeed in science. Number two, um, uh, it's unclear how much of this was written by your advisor, which is like I wrote it. So that was kind of uh, insulting in a way to like, almost like accusing me of plagiarism or something. Third one was um, as a minority student, the applicant should have done more to help other such students. Um, he's participated actively in a variety of outreach activities, none specifically targeting minority students. And at the very end, they wrote, um, no, this application has merits, but these weaknesses temper my enthusiasm, period. Like that was like kind of like hurtful as a student to hear those comments and everything. And so like I printed it off and I showed it to Walter and then Walter is like, oh, this is like, this is not good. Like, you know, this should have been caught at the program manager level. Like how did it even get back? So then he called the program manager and then emailed NSF and then NSF emailed back. And then basically, um, you know, these are blind reviews. We can't reveal who the reviewers are. And without without talking to them, we don't know what they were, what they meant by the, by the um, comments about you should have done more minority outreach instead of, I was focusing on um, rural outreach. So I'm from a very small town um, in Western Missouri uh, near the Kansas border. So like we were um, in a very, um, not only economically underserved, but also, um, you know, the nearest university is over an hour away. Um, uh, the, you know, the resources that are there are just not that great. So that's, and then also um, part of a grant is to be what can be, what's feasible and not just the idealistic pie in the sky type of ideas. So um, that's why I focused on that. And then, you know, two of the reviewers are like, oh, that's excellent. And then one of them is like, no, you're black. So you should have done more to help other black students. Like that was like weird to me, but Walter was like very, immediately like went to my defense and then tried to um you know at least like point out this attention so that hopefully um the reviewer can someone can maybe talk to them if they ever you know know who they are so um i just want to mention that you know being um an ally is was very helpful to me and i think it's like such an important uh, uh thing to be So I'm going, going back to science again. I'm kind of like interlooping science with personal background. So uh, bear with me. So AVRPS4, uh, once it goes into the plant cell, it gets split up into two different uh, fragments. So you have this N-terminal and C-terminal uh, fragment. And the C-terminal fragment is, sorry, uh, the internal fragment is very similar to the N-terminal fragment of another effector called HOPK1. But the C-terminal fragments are very, you know, very little sequence similarity between those between those two. There's just an alignment of the um, AVRPS4 at the top with HOPK1 at the bottom. And so building on the earlier finding that uh, seemed like the N-terminus was interacting with EDS1. So we're thinking like maybe the interminus has a role in immunity or disease susceptibility. So there's a paper um, from uh, Tadeus uh, Rublevsky from UC Davis in um, Richard Mitchell Moore's lab. So he did a pretty high throughput screening of different effectors against different cultivars of lettuce. So uh, UC Davis has a lot of uh, huge library of like different lettuce cultivars. And so the red is the most um, severe hypersensitive response, cell death response. And then the green, the lighter the green, like the uh, uh, less response there is. So it was interesting that the pattern of ADRPS4 with HOPK1 
seemed like almost identical. And knowing that the C terminal domains are so different, then I, I was thinking like maybe the interminal domains um, is what's causing that phenotype. So then I don't know if anyone is from the Midwest or has heard of a store called um, hy V. It's like a it's like a grocery store. So we emailed Davis to get some of these cultivars to test, but then I was so excited. I wanted to like test it as soon as possible. So I went to Hy-Vee and got some lettuce seeds from Hy-Vee. <laughs> and we, um, this is uh, Elizabeth Okafor and Connor Rogan, who are uh, undergrads who were helping me along with this. Um, Elizabeth is at University of Minnesota now and um, she actually switched to human uh, human health so she's doing an md phd program out there um she's gotten she has more publications than i do actually it's really amazing uh, she's um doing a lot of uh, covid um covid 19 research now so she's been very productive and then uh, connor is at oregon state university um uh working with jeff anderson uh on uh pathogens out there so so this um, is uh, infiltrating with agrobacterium to um, expressing different parts of agrobacterium spore to see what the phenotype is. And so what was not, not very surprising, but exciting was, was that agrobacterium spore in terminus over here, and then HOPK1 in terminus here, like both gave that cell death response which indicated that it's doing something with, um, it's being recognized in some capacity. And the C-terminus of POP-K1 or the C-terminus of IgRPS4 didn't give us any response at all. And the full-length version of IgRPS4 and POP-K1 um, both gave kind of like an in intermediate level of um, response and then empty vector just to show that it's not something else causing it. And then uh, we did um, ion leakage assays, so, uh, which is a marker for cell death. So the blue is agricus 4 terminus, has the highest um, amount of ion leakage compared to uh, down here you have uh, empty vector and then in between are the others. So um, agricus 4 c may be a little bit of something um, within margin of error and then um, full length. And then um, we also did like a condemnation. So N terminus and C terminus at the same time, you know, also gives uh, kind of this level of response. And then um, just a protein blot showing that they're being expressed in everything. And then that they're uh, equal level of um, input there. So then we came up with this like bottle for the evolution of chimeric effectors. So on the y-axis is the amplitude of defense. And then on the x-axis is the, got cut, it got cut off there a little bit, I think. Um, but this is the, that's just the oh, okay. evolutionary time. Oh, yeah, like, yep. Sorry. Oh, no, you're totally good, no, no problem. So AVRPS4 and Terminus. So um, I apologize for all the acronyms. Uh, PTI is, uh, again, power and trigger immunity. Um, AVRPS4N suppresses that. To ETS is effector trigger susceptibility. Then you have an R protein that comes in, which gives ETI, so you have more defense. And then you get a fusion of a new C terminus with the N terminus, which again brings you down to a susceptible level. And then this new um, uh, RPS4 RS1 is the R gene care that recognizes AVRPS4 and you get ETI again. So kind of a, um, a little bit like the zigzag model that of uh, plant immunity. So, so apologies for the analogy. <laughs> so most plants are resistant to most pathogens, but likewise, we humans have the, but uh, likewise, we humans have the ability to resist racism in, scientists, in, in science, but it takes work. 
So I was uh, one of the co-founders of Black Botanist Week, which started last summer of 2020, right after the um, Central Park birdwatching incident, um, and the um, around the same time as the um, murder of George Floyd and uh, Breonna Taylor, also. And so Tanisha over here, oops, sorry, cover came off. She put out the call on uh, Twitter. She's like, hey, um, there's this Black Birders Week that was started. I think we should do something similar with, with uh, Black botanists. So then uh, 11 of us kind of came together and with a way to move this forward. So there's Tanisha, there's Knox, who's a professor at a Stellenbosch University in uh, South Africa. There's Georgia, who's also in New York City with um, Washington Square Park Eco Projects. Brandy Cannon was in New York City, but she's starting grad school at uh, Stanford pretty soon here. Uh, Jade is a grad student at, in the UK. And Natasha is a student who's really interested in, so Natasha, it's amazing. She did all of our logos and artwork and everything. And um, she's a amazing artist and also uh, combines um, uh, photography and art with uh, science. Rupert is um, a director at um, uh, Botanical Society in South Africa. Maya is a grad student in New Mexico. Um, there's me who I feel honored to be in, I, I don't feel deserving to be in the presence of everyone, everyone else here. And then there's a Bronda who is an amazing professor at Michigan State University who recently wrote a book that I'll get to later um, if you haven't checked it out yet called Lessons from Plants. And then uh, Tatiana is a grad student in California. And then uh, Tumalong is um, recently graduated grad school and he is in kind of going back and forth between uh, Canada and uh, South Africa. So, so one another thing that was like amazing also is that just the scale of, you know, across continents, across age groups, across um, career stages, but we all got together to get this moving forward. And it's an ongoing movement. So we recently had the 2021 Black Botanist Week, which was also very successful. And uh, this is me with uh, Georgia and Brandy before she moved to California. Um, we had like a little meetup. We did like a, a, a wildflower walk. And like, it was just really cool to like see each other in person because like we'd only met virtually at that point. So, and so we, we wanted to have each day be different and then also differentiated from like last year's version also. So I'm trying to get, you know, new, um, new uh, spin on it. And I don't have, how much time do I have left? Uh, so I should have had my timer going. <laughs> oh, awesome. Oh, thank you so much. So, um, the original Black Botanist Week, we had so much um, positive social media help and support. Um, Margaret Frank, uh, that's what I thought. Okay, great to meet you in person. <laughs> um, I want to say thank you because like you did an amazing job like amplifying us and like spreading the word and everything. So thank you so much for that. And we had um, even Margaret Atwood, the author, made a tweet about us. She's like, oh, everyone should check out this Black Botanist Week. Um, we had a USA Today feature. We had um, uh, Georgia went on the um, New York City's biggest uh, radio, New York City's uh, NPR affiliate to talk about it. So we had like a really nice um, exposure and it was just like a very uplifting thing. And another thing I'd like to point out, so we gave a lecture series um, in collaboration with um, Holden Forest and Gardens called uh, Growing Black Roots, The Black Botanical Legacy. And so all of us gave, a, gave our, our own different talk and like each of it, each of them were very um, 
different and unique. And we had a lot, a lot of freedom to explore kind of whatever we wanted to, um, if, has, as long as it related to, um, you know, Black experience with plants. And so I think my talk is on YouTube. So I delved into a lot of, um, you know, personal background of, um, you know, growing up in a, you know, a small 95% white town and then kind of that experience. And um, so just very briefly, so I go into more detail in that talk, but my um, great, 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 great grandfather. Yes, I want to make sure I get all the, <laughs> all the greats correct. Um, was the slave of the founder of my hometown. And so I'm like the first generation to actually leave my hometown. So like my mom is still living there, dad's still living there. Um, we have that like, you know, direct line to um, being brought there from Kentucky with um, General George R. Smith is his name. Um, very, uh, there's, there's a long history back there. So if you want to check out the talk at your own leisure. Um, and then also all the other talks are just so, and I got so much from them and they're so interesting and they each cover a diff very different, um, you know, different corner, so to speak. So they're really amazing. So we recently published um, this paper. So, well, not re very recently, it was like earlier this year, uh, Growing a Community, the inaugural Black Botanist Week recap, looking forward. And this is just a way to kind of see how things went for the first year and then um, offer kind of like a window, a window towards the future for how we wanted to see how things progress and everything. And we have uh, five action item, five action items in this in that publication that I can go through quickly. Uh, so the first one is a journey of truth and unlearning the propaganda you have been taught to keep the system of oppression in place. We're asking everyone to dig deep and learn about the true history of your country and the world. Examine how continued compliance or negligence of citizens and the passing of laws have systematically disadvantaged Black people around the world. Uh, the second one. Listen to Black people about their lived experiences. Examine why it is so hard to hear and empathize with someone else's truth. The third one, identify racial inequalities and disparities. So these should be identified in every aspect of one's life, healthcare, education, income. Examine how these inequalities and dis disparities harm Black people. The fourth one, identify racist and or biased ideas, implicit or not you, your organization, et cetera, hold. Examine how these ideas came to be, what's wrong about these ideas, and work in ways to actively change racist views and or biases. And the last one is uh, support uh, the people, organizations, and legislation that are actively doing anti-racist work. There are many local, national, and global civic organizations working towards racial equity and social justice. Um, in ways in your daily life, you can actively work towards being anti-racist and counteract, counteracting persistent biases and inequalities. Um, it's a lifelong commitment we all must make to see a world where there is equality for all. And I also wanted to commend Cornell. Um, I was, you know, as I was going through um, uh, lab photos and everything, I was looking at uh, Dr. Buckler's lab and just like saw the racial diversity there, which is not, it's not like that most of the time I would say. So um, I was like very happy to see that. Um, um, I was talking with um, Don earlier, he just had to take off, but um, we're talking about how a lot of universities sometimes, they put out a statement like, you know, we support, we support you and everything, but don't actually have any actions behind the words. So, um, you know, it's like, it's really cool to see examples where there is um, kind of like an idiom, like putting money where your mouth is, so to speak, and uh, actually backing up words with action. So um, just yeah, using, I uh, don't want to put you on the spot, but I just wanted to um, commend your lab for being such a diverse group and everything. So, And I mentioned earlier, uh, Dr. Montgomery has this book that I really recommend reading uh, called Lessons from Plants. And this came out from 
very recently uh, this year, and she does a great job of interweaving her personal experiences of being a professor of plant biology with the through observing plants, how we humans can learn tolerance and acceptance and um, um, adaptability and um, community enrichment and helping those around you. She has a very good quote that she, I don't know if it's in the book, but she mentioned this in our talk that I heard recently. It's that we should be groundskeepers more than gatekeepers. And by that, what, what she's um, saying, what she said was um, a lot of academia, academia is, um, you know, uh, kind of gatekeeping. So, um, which can lead to, if not conscious bias, uh, unconscious bias. So instead, you know, being a groundskeeper, so um, um, being more compassionate, being open to admit, admitting our, our own um, faults and mistakes. So I really, this book is really amazing. I highly recommend it. And I'll finish off with a personal observation. So through all the spaces I've been through, not many people look like me. However, there are hopeful signs of change in academia and elsewhere. We can't expect others to change things for us. We should be actively part of the change. And um, I was talking with uh, Dr. Buckler earlier about how it's hard to see change as you're going through it sometimes, but then you can like look back 10 years, 20 years down the road and be like, oh yeah, we were, things were actually improving at the time, but I just didn't really notice it, if that makes sense. So um, I think that I'm already seeing a lot of hopeful signs of change. So um, I'm uh, definitely optimistic on this, on this front. Um, if I had a longer talk, uh, I would go into climate change and everything, <laughs> the other things that to be up, hopefully, I wish I could be more optimistic about. But um, yeah, I think on this front, I think changes are happening. And um, I was talking with Don earlier, and he mentioned how um, it's very, um, trying to think of the wording, the wording that he used. Um, it's, oh my gosh, I'm like blanking on, it was, it was, it was to the effect of like, you know, change, um, you know, being hard to notice in the moment, but um, looking back you'll see how you know how far we come and everything so um and i will end there and i wanted to thank you so much for coming and um this is my first in-person talk since for like two years or something so this is really i was like really honored to be here and um i hope i have time for questions if anyone has any so thank you so much yes dr Buckley. so how you know, you had, it looked like I couldn't see. You had about five different activities. Were, were those all in New York City, or have people kind of were doing different activities in different locations for Black Fun this week? And how is that kind of working? That's a great question. So we were worldwide. Um, so, and this was, you know, during the early days of the pandemic. So we were all doing it virtually for the most part, um, and. One thing that we were, you know, we're, this is still has a lot of momentum to it. So we're going to keep this going forward. I envision it as being less of a, you know, Black Bonus Week for 2020, 2021, 2022, and make it instead more of like a, um, not, to, not to use a plant pun, but like a perennial as opposed to an annual <laughs> thing. So <laughs> kind of have it, you know, grow. <laughs> go uh, kind of throughout the year more. So that would be amazing. That's a really good question. Yes. So um, currently Black Botanist Week is in July, correct? Correct. Have y'all considered moving it to a time period when schools are open to sort of have the opportunity um, for uh, partnership and collaboration with schools and teachers, especially life science teachers, to 
introduce it to children at a younger age because in my mind, July is great because you have so much bloom, mm-hmm. but the downside of it is unless you're a child who has access to some type of after school care or some type of um, summer camp or things as extracurricular type activities, you don't necessarily have the opportunity to have guided um, engagement with something like this that I think a lot of children uh, nationwide, much less globally, would be very interested in. That is a great, great point. Uh, Aisha, right? Aliyah. Aliyah, oh my God, I'm so sorry. Oh my gosh. I Apologies, I met some, I was like trying to keep my name straight and everything. I'm so sorry, Aliyah. Um, so that is a great question. So that's something that we have it in July mainly for like, just like historical significance now since like the first one started during, um, uh, you know, the Black Lives Matter when that was starting up and everything and other, um, you know, other groups are coming up like, you know, Black and Neuro, Black and Microbiology, all these things. So um, we are thinking, me personally, I don't want to speak for the committee, but uh, I personally would be open to having more like during the school year, during the academic year and, um, you know, increasing um, collaboration with, you know, students and universities and that sort of thing. Um, I was talking with Don earlier, he mentioned, um, uh, you know, increasing collaboration with uh, other botanic gardens, things like that. So that's a really great point. And we're gonna be meeting, we have another meeting coming up soon. So I will bring that up. So Aaliyah. Yeah. Perfect. I'm so sorry. I don't know, I had Alicia in my head. I'm so sorry. Apologies. <laughs> Apologies. We've only met about 70 people today. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> that's a lot of people. <laughs> but I won't forget it now. It's like, as soon as I, Get a name wrong, then it. I remember it more. So. <laughs> yes. Along with what Alia just said, what about coming up with some type of curriculum that you can introduce at that, you know, primary intermediate stage to get that proverbial ball rolling? Mm-hmm. That's that's where the you're going to grab those children's minds and get them interested. Abs- it's fascinating. No. Absolutely. Um, can I get your name? I'm Deirdre. Deirdre. Yes. That was a great question. So that's another thing that I was thinking about. Um, so one thing I've done, I didn't talk about it in this talk, but um, I guess a little bit when I was mentioning going to uh, um, underserved communities and everything. So, you know, going to, you know, middle schools, high schools, um, you know, just having them see another Black botanist in front of them, like, is an actual, actually a real thing. Um, you know, per, again, like, I didn't even know that a plant research career was even, even a thing until I heard about Walter's lab and through the work study program. And I'm like, well, that's like amazing that I didn't even, never even knew that existed, you know? So I think um, definitely a lot of our work has been towards adults with Black Botanist Week, but I think definitely doing more for, um, at that age when students don't even know the uh, options that are out there and possibly, possibly uh, I'm so tongue-tied, possibilities that are out there. So I think that would be fantastic. Yes. So I guess to piggyback on all the other comments is, did, did you have any suggestions on how, uh, on the instructor level, I'm an active learning postdoc, so I sit in a lot of the undergraduate classes, how can we incorporate, you know, Black Bot this week or, just black scientists in our classrooms. Like, I don't know if you guys are talking about coming up with the curriculum, activities or suggestions. That is a great question. Uh, what's your name? Anna. Anna. So one thing, um, we do have some resources and like classroom ideas and activities. We've, we have them deposited on the Holden Forest and Garden website where they have the lecture series. So, and they're kind of um, tailored towards each topic and idea, but like a lot of them are, can be broadly applicable, I would say. So if you go to that website and I can, um, it's like just the Holden Forest website and then um, uh, click on the black, Growing Black Roots section, there's a bunch of resources on there you can um, use yeah, for. Twitter, so like we can connect oh, absolutely. Oh, awesome. That'd be perfect. <laughs> exactly. Yes. 
I was just going to say, as a plant pathologist, I very much appreciate it. Oh, thank you. <laughs> awesome. Thank you. So plant pathologist following here today. Oh, awesome. Um, <laughs> and uh, I was also going to say, I completely agree with you about Veranda Montgomery's book. And oh, I'm going awesome. to tell the audience that we do actually have free copies of the book available at the six main office if anyone is interested. Oh, awesome. So, who was it that uh, ran the thing? Uh, it was our diversity and inclusion council. And, uh, oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, that was so, so they took the book and, and we read it. And we tried to read as much as we could. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. And then, and then the coolest part was we got into groups and not just faculty and faculty, but faculty and staff, students with postdocs. Yeah. It, it was really, really amazing to sit and talk. Oh, that's different people. Like we just sat outside. This is wonderful. Oh, that's so amazing. I'm sorry to hear that. And I'll, I'll tell her when I meet with her next, and she'll, yeah, yeah, she'll be yeah, so yeah. excited. <laughs> that's awesome. Yes. Um, so uh, I'm trying to figure out where they have questions here. Um, so downstairs on our LCD screen, we have. Um, couple of infographics about so and so. This is how little I picked it up, but um, the names of uh, two people from I think like the 1910s yeah. or 1910s. Yeah. Right, and then there's just sort of 90 years of bupkis basically. And uh, <laughs> years ago, um, we had an external uh, audit of SIP, I think it was all of SIPs, and it looked at um, not just uh, the demographic breakdown of our faculty and student body, but also our applicant pool, I believe. Mm -hmm. And uh, perhaps the most disappointing was the real lack of diversity in our applicant pool, uh, both at the student, grad student and faculty level. Um, and so this is classic, you know, white person asking black people, like, what are we doing wrong and how come, yeah. Um, but, uh, what have you seen at other schools that are uh, schools of plant science in general that um, they're doing to attract um, plant scientists and students who are interested in plant science uh, who are not white or Southeast Asian? That's a great, great question. And and a thing I should have pointed out, I talk about this more in my Holden talk, but it's not just uh, you know, things that, you know, at the university stage, there is a, you know, long history of systemic racism in our country. So, and that's, you know, I was talking about like my slavery ancestors and the um, lack of opportunities that have been going down and like I'm first generation to leave my hometown and everything. So um, that is the taproot of a lot of the problems, I would say. So, um, uh, you know, going back to slavery and not having those equal opportunities and everything. So what we, what we all collectively should be doing um, is, this is getting kind of philosophical, but you know, like working on legislation and um, trying to narrow those disparity gaps. So um, um, like I'm a big fan of like slavery reparations, for example, um, like those won't help narrow the gap but like won't close the gap but might help narrow the gap i would say and um breaking down the disparities that are neighborhood by neighborhood and you're in a certain school which enables you to get which limits your chances to, to go somewhere else and um there's so much like inbuilt structure there for social um, climbing to even get to the point of the application stage anyway. So um, I think that a lot of that's out of our hands, but I think that doing the, starting off with our own like self-reflection and like the action items, um, those are small changes which will eventually down the road lead to bigger like you no know, legislative change and um, it's, you know, Rome wasn't, Rome wasn't built in a day, so it's gonna take many, many years, but um, uh, I think each person kind of in, individually doing what we can is gonna be very beneficial. So that's a great question. And um, it's, uh, 
and I feel like this talk was kind of like focusing on like ways that science can improve, but it's not just science, it's other parts of society also. So um, it's a, that's something I should have brought up earlier, but yeah, it's a, a can, you know, a big canopy that science is a part of, so. Thank you so much. This has been a production of Cornell University on the web at cornell.edu.